I'm Amber and welcome to the Lone Star Keto podcast. Today we have a special guest, Rob Amoroso. Welcome, Rob. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, I love what you're doing on your podcast. I see you're working at you're working very hard and you have some interesting guests. And I figured I would just reach out to you and I would love to have a conversation. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you did. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. I know Rob is starting a new uh, com- a new business and it's called the Human Growth Factor. And um, I want you to tell us a little bit about that. And why did you get, why did you decide to do this? There's got to be a reason why you're trying to venture out and, and create this business because it's not easy. Yeah, so um, essentially uh, the human growth factor is a business where we will take our clients towards um, optimal peak uh, human form. So for everyone that will be different, but um, essentially someone will feel really good about themselves, both emotionally, physically. Um, They will also be spiritually aligned. Um, I know a lot of people don't really focus on their chakras or don't focus on their breath or don't focus on yoga or, you know, keeping themselves um, flexible, but everything ties together. I mean, the muscles send signals to the brain and tell the brain basically if there's, if it's stressed or not, Um, tight muscles put a lot of strain on the joints. So um, what I'm trying to do with my company is sort of build a foundation where people can go to learn. And then if they, don't have time to kind of take their own supplements if they need them. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of neurohacking. So I like to get the very most out of my, my mind in a day. So simple things like, uh, you know, acetyl carnitine, which is actually found in red meat, but it's an acetylated form. So it's a little bit more bioavailable. It allows your brain to kind of think more quickly. Um, then you have things like triacetyluridine, just things that are very um, helpful for the brain to build new synapses and learn a little bit quicker. Um, these things can be found in foods, but um, they're more concentrated. And uh, really, when you take them and you stack them, they really optimize your performance. So I would be you know, teaching people a little bit about those. But again, if they can't make them themselves, I will be creating supplements and stacks for people to take in their busy lives and allow them to kind of learn a little bit quicker. I think that's the most important thing is humans ability to learn. The main premise behind human growth factor is there are many variations to how someone can, um, how someone can grow, but ultimately the human superpower is learning. Um, No species can come anywhere near our ability to learn. We're not strongest. We're not fastest and we're definitely not the fastest at reproduction. But when it comes to thinking and intellect, we win every single time. So that's where we should be focusing. And Human Growth Factor is going to teach people what to learn, why to learn it, and how to learn. I love that. And that's really interesting. And today, I, ha- I, I, put, I reposted somebody's post, and it was something I found very interesting. I'm not saying that I believe 100% in it or that I know everything about it or anything, but I found it very, very interesting. I had somebody so triggered by that because apparently that offends somebody who is, it it was basically about uh, pregnancy and how if your hormones aren't balanced, it can affect the baby's hormones too. And the, the person was really upset because it was like saying that if you're not perfect, that you're damaging your kid and you don't understand about infertility and all this. And, and they were so triggered. But my whole point was, this is interesting information. Somebody might could benefit from it. Maybe that'll take that person to go and look stuff up and learn. And it doesn't mean you have to apply it to your life necessarily, but what's the harm in putting information out? And so I absolutely agree with you. Learning, uh, knowledge is power, people, you know, it's just, uh, anyway, let me, I want to read your mission. I, I, I saw this on your website and I printed it off because I think it's really cool and I like this. 
to fully train and educate open-minded clients on how to achieve optimal physical fitness, body composition, and mindfulness. Our building blocks for human growth, development, and behavior change by implementing holistic functional training and nutrition education. I love that. So talk a little bit more about that. Kind of elaborate. What do you mean by that? And you kind of touched on it, but. Yeah, so basically um, our mission uh, to, I guess, get a little bit more detailed is um, we want to give a full detailed explanation as to why we're doing something and what we're trying to achieve. A lot of people and trainers, coaches, etc., they don't tell people why they're doing certain things. They just say to do it and people are like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And then they kind of fall off the boat and they don't know why they kind of lost their motivation. But one of the keys to keeping with something and keeping a routine is knowing why you're doing it and knowing what it's going to do for your body. So to really fully train and educate clients is a big deal. I think to really like get a full, well-rounded approach, um, it's very complex and it's tough. And um, I want to be making, you know, online courses in the future and then, additional kind of um, extra times. So like at counseling or co- uh, coaching on the side. So if people want extra questions or something answered about the co- uh, courses, by all means, I want them to reach out to me. Um, and then along with that, like I said, the supplements would be there as well. If people want to maximize the ability of their brain to really uh, grasp the information, um, neuroplasticity is a big thing these days getting your brain to be as, as fully flexible, so to speak, as possible. The brain literally changes itself on a daily basis, and it can do that just with a thought. So the brain restructures itself, the mind restructures itself based on itself. It's, it, there's a very complex phenomenon. I think it's, there's a book written about it, the mind that changes itself, something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, these aspects that we're going to focus on are going to help people with, you know, whether it's addiction issues to either sugar or to opiates or whatever it is. Um, I think if people really drill in on what the root issues are, whether there's traumas or or there are um, um, not valuing themselves enough, maybe uh, they've been talked down to their whole lives, whatever the case may be, we want to be there to really help our clients to grow in a, in a holistic way. I, I love how you're taking such a holistic approach to this. So it's not just one thing. It's not just going in the gym, working out and getting muscles and looking fit because you can look good, but not be healthy and not be mentally healthy. And yeah. you're not going to be able to maintain that because you don't have the whole component, you know, the, the whole all the pieces to the puzzle and you focus on the mental, the spiritual, the emotional, the, the physical. And I think that's so important. And I think so many of us don't do that. We focus on nutrition or we focus on just working out in the gym or, you know, or we do yoga and, you know, the, the meditation stuff, but not the other. So there's, there's all these pieces and it sounds like what you're trying to do is bring all those pieces together. So it's complete. So you get the complete, you know, healing that you need. And I love that. I think that's a, that's such a great approach and you don't see that. Yeah. It's, it's a very complex thing because um, a lot of people can uh, only put their mind towards one thing at a time, but just like we go to school and learn multiple subjects at a time, we can do this as well. I kind of almost want to rewrite the uh, learning system because it's clearly not that effective these days. Um, I don't see many people using Pythagorean theorem. I don't see many people using what they learned in history class. Um, But the things that I want to be teaching, such as the chakras and breathing, cold exposure, you know, nutrition, carnivore, why meat is the most nutrient dense food on the planet. These things aren't taught in school. I, I never had a nutrition class in high school. And I had one course in uh, uh, going for exercise physiology. So I really think, and and actually in exercise physiology, we never even talked about ketosis. My teacher mentioned that uh, Jeff Volek was doing keto adaptation. um, And she, it was one slide on a PowerPoint around the entire classroom. Nobody asked any questions. I was like, wait, 
they're using this for soldiers to be more strong and, and uh, have like athletic performance. And then she moved to the slide. I'm like, wait, wait, you just left me on such a cliffhanger. And everyone else was like completely, you know, unfazed by it. So I took the initiative in 2014 to dig into it more. I was like, that's insane that they're using this diet to help people. So I, I dug into it and uh, my friend said he wanted to lose weight at the time. And I was like, okay, well, I heard about this diet, like give it a shot. No one had heard of keto at the time. So when he would tell people he was doing keto, they're like, oh, like ketoacidosis, you're going to, you're going to kill yourself. And I'm like, no, it's not ketoacidosis. It's a little bit different. Um, so yeah, in 2014, nobody knew what it was. And uh, him and I were just laughing about it because it, we knew it was going to be the next big thing. But um, now in 2020, we're looking at the carnivore diet and seemingly now the plants are you know, big issues. And some people have a very strong immune response. And, um, you know, whether they've been triggered from exposure to, you know, metals, heavy metals, toxins, uh, you name it, you know, they can have a very strong immune, immune response. And that never shuts off people on a chronic basis, you can see that their face is red all the time. You can see that their skin has eczema, you can see whatever their body's trying to cope with these toxins, and they just keep going and going and going. So I, I really believe that um, giving a full spectrum of information and knowledge in a, in a very um, easy to learn format can be very helpful to a lot of people. Oh yeah, that's for sure. I see this on a daily basis. So I totally feel you there. Um, give us a little bit of your background. Like you mentioned, you were a um, personal trainer. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Where is your interest in health coming from? There has to be a reason. And did you struggle with any issues, whether it was health or gaining weight or whatever it was? Yeah. So uh, my journey, I was very, I was a very bad student in school. I uh, had ADHD um, to a very strong degree. Um, whenever I would eat very sugary food before school, n never correlated the two. I would always get a phone call home. I was being, I was being uh, very fresh or I was being like a, a class clown at the time and like just freaking out in class and like shooting pencils across the room and just causing like a ton of commotion. And all the teachers were like, we love him, but he's so like, he's just, he's just too much. He's, he's got too much energy. So we never put it, the, the pieces together. And, um, a little bit down the road, I was, in high school, I started lifting. Um, I, at one point, got set up in like a, some sort of fight, um, and uh, I got beat up, so I started working out, and um, eventually, I actually started getting good at it, and people in the gym class were like, are you, like, taking steroids? Like, you look phenomenal at your age. I'm like, no, I'm just kind of working out, and I'm doing the best I can. I was just doing pull-ups and bench press and just simple stuff. And eventually I developed a following. A lot of people were asking me how I was doing what I was doing. So in high school, I realized that uh, I really enjoyed training people. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do for college. And then somebody mentioned the idea of personal training or uh, physical therapy or just learning about the body. That's, you know, sports science. I was like, yeah, I would, I would love to learn about the body, love to learn about the muscles. So I went to DeSales University went there for sports science for physical therapy. At the time, I still did not know how to learn. So in anatomy and physiology class, I just was not grasping the information. It was too complex for me. I, it was in a huge lecture hall, so I really wasn't able to ask the questions I needed to. The teacher was a little bit more stern. And uh, it really didn't click for me until I transferred out of the school <laughs> And I started, uh, you know, I really, I transferred out because I didn't want to do um, athletic training anymore. Long story short, I was going for physical therapy, but it wasn't for me. I just, I wasn't grasping the information enough and I ended up transferring out senior year to uh, Purdue University where I um, finished with a health and wellness degree. And when I left the school, ironically enough, I was able to kind of learn how to learn. And I started listening to podcasts and um, specifically Elliot Holson on his way of thinking. and um, A lot of his motivational talks and the way of being. 
and um, I started using certain supplements and certain um, Ethiopians, and I started learning things about myself, and my mind just started like grasping more information at a time. And I realized that I'm an auditory learner and I realized that the way I'm taught in school is not the way I learn. I have to listen to the video. I have to stop, pause it. I have to look up a visualization of it. I have to really understand it. When I'm reading it, I have to read it as if I'm going to teach it. So all these aspects kind of showed me how to, um, you know, learn how to learn. And a lot of people don't know that they're different that they need different ways to learn things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always had a, a burning passion to help people. I like, even when I was younger, I, I had like flunk out kids who would just smoke cigarettes. I'm like, why would you do that to yourself? I never understood why people would self-sabotage. And I was like, you know, like stop doing that. I won't, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. If you smoke cigarettes, like anything to try to like help them out. But um, yeah, I mean, it came easily to me because I had a lot of acne as well in uh, college or not college in high school. As I was gaining all this weight, I would also um, get all this acne and I didn't know why. So we went to the dermatologist and they said, uh, he said, stop eating white foods. And I was like, I was like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, what do you mean? Stop white foods. That, that doesn't, it doesn't cause acne. And long story short, I found out that it was the blue cheese that I was eating on my buffalo chicken every day after work or every day after school. Um, blue cheese uh, has mold in it, and it's a huge histamine response. So my whole face was like a pepperoni face for forever. Wow. And that was the first thing I realized that, uh, you know, what you eat does have a huge impact on your health, on your, on your skin. Your skin is the biggest organ in the body. So, yeah, I mean, with that, I, would, I definitely learned that there is more to the story than just calories in, calories out. Oh, that's for sure. And I, I think that's true with most of us who have this passion. It's like once you see something, you can't unsee it and you want everybody else to see it too. And so you, you can't shut up. You know, It's like I have this amazing secret and I have to tell people because they don't seem to know. How do they not know? You know, how is this information not out there? And so you, you have this passion to help get the word out there. And I think uh, we can still say that what we're trying to promote is still not out there. And there are many forces working against us because they don't want that out there. Because, boy, that would really upset the status quo, don't you think? I mean, yeah. you know, wh what about your ADHD? Okay. You figured out eventually what was causing some of that issue, right? Yeah. Were, were you ever put on medication for that? Yeah. When I was really little, I was put on medication. Um, I know I was put on Adderall as a young kid, and I was put on another one, um, I want to say Ritalin, but maybe uh, it could be wrong. One of the stimulants. And I just got enormous headaches from it. And my teachers were even telling my mother, like, you know, he's a zombie. He's not himself anymore. They, it kind of took away my, I don't know, essence, so to speak. I, I, was, I wasn't acting up anymore, but I just was like a zombie. I was kind of just doing my thing. And my mother was like, I'm taking him off this stuff. Like, I don't like how he is. Um, it's, not, it's not who he is. Um, but yeah, I had a very hard time sitting still and learning. So again, when I went to high school and I started working out, I was able to almost release a lot of the um, hyperactivity aspect of it. I still wasn't really able to focus until, like I said, after I left college and I started using the ketogenic diet. I never did ketogenic diets until... 2016, even after I gave my friend the advice, I still wasn't doing it because I didn't want to give up my Raisin Bran Crunch at night. It was like my book too. Um, that and like a banana every night before I went to bed. And uh, as I started to try to cut the carbs, I'm like, I, I think I'm actually addicted. Like my body is like forcing me to kind of eat this stuff. And it's at one point I was eventually able to kind of cut it, but it, it was a while until I was able to actually cut the cut cut the ties um, but after that I was able to keep my energy level stable I was able to focus on things um, ketones raise you know the brain derived nootropic factor the 
protein that grows brain cells. Um, it's uh, fasting and keto also mimic um, the effect of, I think it's orexin. There's a hormone that the hypothalamus releases that keeps you alert and focused. Basically says you're starving and you should look for food. Um, that hormone is very powerful because if you're not, if you're fed, and if you're eating all these carbs and stuff, you're not going to be focused, you're not going to be alert, you're going to be tired, sluggish, you're not going to be doing anything. You're just going to be sitting at a desk job, kind of jotting away here and there, but you're not going to be really like engrossed into the activity. So I didn't really fix the ADHD until I was able to fast and do ketogenic diets. And then not only the nutrition aspects, but the physical aspects, I had to go like do way harder workouts, like HIT, high intensity interval training, huge amounts of sprints, um, more weightlifting. And eventually there was like sort of a balance, but even so it's still been very hard to focus on tasks that I'm not interested in. You see a lot of people think they have ADHD, but really it's just, they don't care about the subject at hand. As soon as you get someone's emotions involved, and then they're interested. You can get anyone interested. You take away a kid's toy with ADHD, he's going to be very interested in how he gets back. Um, so it's it, there's a lot of aspects to it. It's not just food. It's not just exercise. It's not just uh, the boredom aspect. It's all of them to be able to focus. The brain is a huge organ. It needs a tremendous amount of nutrition and fat. The brain is 70% fat, maybe more. I could be wrong. But there are so many aspects that go into it. But really, the the main points is the ketogenic diet, fasting, and then uh, you know high intensity exercise with huge amounts of nutrition from animal products. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, what advice would you give, say, a parent who has a child? who is on the standard American diet and they're also on ADH medication. And I mean, you know, like you said, I, I've known quite a few kids who have been on that and various medications and they are zombies. They're not, they're not right. It's, it's like just kind of going through life with this, you know, veil on or something. What advice would you give the parents? Like, well, I would say, I would simply put it that um, they're giving their kid amphetamine. It says it on the label. Um, I don't think that's very ethical to begin with. I don't think it's a good idea to give little kids amphetamine. It's the huge stimulant. Some some parents don't even want to give the kid caffeine at a young age, but they'll give them pharmaceutical because someone in a white coat said to to take it. Um, what the amphetamine does, or stimulants in general is they release a tremendous amount of dopamine into the brain and uh, dopamine in high amounts is very toxic. So there's a byproduct or metabolite called dopamine quinone that actually causes a down regulation of the dopamine receptors. So it will uh, magnify the issue when the drug is not used. And uh, this could be something that is um, helpful for the companies that make the drug because they need more of the drug in order to get the desired effects. And if you stop taking it, you can't focus at all. It's, it's worse than it was before. Mm. So a lot of parents need to focus on, well, why can't my kid focus? What's the, what's the problem? So I would first start by saying, you know, your kid is on amphetamine. Um, their brain is going to be ruined for the rest of their life. If you don't act now, you need to be a parent. And you need to stop taking other people's advice. You need to do your own research. You need to make the best decisions that you can come up with. And uh, they need, I mean, simply put, kids are growing. They need a tremendous amount of nutrition for their brain, for their health, for their muscles to grow. Um, a lot of kids are just sitting and playing video games these, day, and these days. They don't focus on going outside and playing with their friends. There's just iPads and phones. And it's just, it's really scary to see because, I feel old now looking outside and just not many kids are outside playing. So a big aspect is, is just giving your kids enough protein. I mean, dopamine is made of protein um, as are other neurotransmitters and protein is the most satiating. And I'm not talking plant protein because that's barely digestible. It's, it's going to wreck the digestive system. And then on top of that, you have all the glyphosate, the roundup, all the pesticides that come with that. 
and that's going to wreck the digestive system. And where's the microbiome located? It's in the digestive system, right where you're putting all the Roundup and all the plant toxins. So it really exacerbates the issue. Yeah, so essentially the microbiome has a tremendous amount of bacteria that uh, also contribute to the formation of neurotransmitters. So these are called psychobiotics, psycho for the mind and biotics bacteria. Um, they create these neurotransmitters like serotonin. 90% of serotonin is created in the gut. Um, and there are links to, you know, autism and stuff like that, where there's gut dysfunction and the kid just simply can't focus. Dopamine is also created in the gut and uh, the precursors to dopamine as well. So again, if this microbiome is getting decimated by, um, you know, all these toxins and uh, heavy metals that are, you know, put into the kids at a young age, this can severely decrease the kid's ability to learn and cope with emotions and the symptoms never end. It will never get better until the roots are addressed. So what dietary approach? You mentioned you know, making sure you get good protein, but what kind of a dietary approach, if you will, do you think will, would benefit a child with ADHD the most? Obviously, if sugar tends to be a big issue, you don't want a diet that has sugar in it. Right. So, I mean, I, I would definitely propose the idea of a not a carnivorous diet because a lot of parents would be like, Oh no, that's too much, too much animal food. Like that's going to be bad. But um, if they could just simply start adding in more eggs, adding in more ground beef, adding in more meatloaf, you know, as long as it's mixed with a plant, it's not that bad. Right. So um, if they could just start implementing more of that, um, I, whenever I would have eggs in the morning as a young kid, I would never get a phone call home and we never, we didn't put that together until way later down the road. I was like, oh, I get it now. The eggs didn't give me problems, but the maple syrup and waffles, that was when I would go off the walls. Cereal. <laughs> yes. I actually never was, I was never a big cereal person in the morning. Um, and uh, luckily my mother would always give me a little bit of butter on everything. So maybe I got a, a tiny bit of nutrition on that. And I would, for lunch, I would just take a bagel, cinnamon raisin bagel with butter. So I would get a little bit of nutrition from that butter every day. It was just enough to get me by. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, parents do kind of freak out when, if you were to say, you know what, how about we just focus on meat right now? Let's not worry about all the other stuff and just see what happens. And then if you feel you need to you add it back in, but it's so hard, but a ketogenic diet would be the next best thing really um, to, to give it a go and you still get your plants. But do you feel like plants could possibly be causing issues as well um, as far as uh, somebody with ADHD. I mean, is that an issue? So as of right now, I haven't found any plants that would cause the ADHD problems. I'm sure they would exacerbate the problems from, um, you know, secondary effects. Like I said, the glyphosate wiping out the microbiome. Um, but a lot of kids have IBS. They can't digest food at all. So if that's the case, then they can't digest any nutrition or very little nutrition from the food. So the brain can't work close to optimal at all. So I don't, I don't know of any plants as of right now, obviously for the sweet ones and the starchy ones, the ones that are super high in carbs. Yeah, of course. I mean, the glucose spike is going to go up and then the kid's going to have no energy at all at the end of it. And then they're just going to have to do it all over again. Their brain can never correlate or never um, compensate for the constant glucose fluctuations. Yeah. My daughter had a, uh, well, she's still her best friend. Um, and they did gymnastics together and you know, it, it, with the issues she had, it, she would get very aggressive if she didn't have her medication. But when she did have her medication, she was kind of like a different person. So it was kind of like one of these things. So, you know, I always felt so bad and they were constantly having to change the medication and, and mess with the dosages and stuff. And what you said about the whole uh, issue with the medication is very eye opening because that would explain a whole lot of what they went through. And, you know, that was really, uh, 
so, so hard on that family to have to deal with that, you know, and, and the poor kid, I felt horrible for her too, because she just, it's like this hard to control kind of stuff going on, but yeah. Okay. So you are a big proponent of fasting. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So fasting is the only thing that can give the body a chance to clean itself out. Um, a lot of people love eating and they love the enjoyment that eating gives, but um, no personal growth can be made without um, compromise and without um, giving up a little bit of comfort. So allowing your digestive system to stop working for just enough time you know, not just eight hours and then go right back to eating crap again, because eight hours is not enough considering a lot of people eat the wrong foods on a daily basis, let alone eating in general. They need to start doing a little bit longer than just eight hours when they're sleeping. 16 hours is the gold standard for people who want to lose weight. 12 to 14 hours is a circadian rhythm fast. That's eating when the sun is up only. That would help a lot of people out as well. You should not eat when the sun's down leads to midnight snacking, and it also messes with the microbiome as well. Everything we put into our body changes the microbiome and will dictate your cravings for the next day and for the next hour, little than that. Um, so another thing I'm, I'm a big proponent of is if you want the cravings to stop, you buy a tongue scraper. Tongue scrapers are, you know, not even listened to or heard about. They uh, scrape all the bacteria and debris off the tongue. So when the oral microbiome is not cleaned out properly, you know, everyone says to, or the dentist says to brush your tongue with a little toothbrush, but those are just bristles, you know, they're not going to get all the debris off. A tongue scraper is a piece of metal that's going to take that entire film off the tongue. And a lot of people with, you know, really bad breath or uh, dental problems and stuff like that, they have so much debris on their tongue, they, they can't even taste their food. And then they need sweeter and sweeter and they need more flavors. And uh, their microbiome just gets more and more um, greedy for those foods. And if you want to stop the cravings, start with the uh, tongue scraping. Um, I, use my, I, I also use hydrogen peroxide at night, 3%, a little bit, swish it around. Cleans out the whole mouth, takes the debris out from everywhere. Um, and then I brush. Um, it's, it's way more efficient than just brushing your teeth with fluoride. I'm a huge, um, uh, I'm very against fluoride use as well. It, it binds to the calcium in the teeth and it binds to the calcium in the bones. It's also, fluoride has been used to slow down the thyroid um, for people with hyperthyroidism in the past. And fluoride was a byproduct of aluminum making. Um, I think in the seventies and they had to find out how to get rid of it. So they decided to, you know, fire off a marketing campaign to, to do something with the fluoride and they ended up putting it on in our toothpaste and in our water. So that fluoride has actually been shown to lower IQ in, um, in children as well. And it blocks thyroid from reaching or it blocks iodine from reaching the thyroid gland. Wow. So that's just another compounded issue. Mm. I have never heard of the tongue thing. I, I've heard of it, it used, the scraping used for, you know, bad breath and stuff like that, but the cravings, but the way you explained it, it kind of does make sense. That's a very interesting. I'm going to have to do some research on that. That That is just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. I always kind of, um, these thoughts always like pop in my head on a daily basis. I'm like, hmm. I didn't have any cravings after a tongue scrape today. I wonder why. And I know that the microbiome in the gut controls a lot of our cravings. So it only makes sense that the microbiome in the mouth also plays a role there. And uh, this is what a tongue scraper looks like. It's very simple. Um, you oh. hold it here, stick out your tongue, and you scrape oh. the back. Hmm. Further back you go, the more effective it is. It's like $2, uh, very effective. Very interesting. I always brush my tongue, but I've never used a scraper. That's very interesting. It's very, very effective. Oh, very cool. All right. Very interesting. You learn something new every day. Okay. Let me see what am I not. <laughs> okay. Talk a little bit about why, because you're doing the carnivore diet pretty much. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so essentially when I'm trying to gain a little bit of muscle mass, I will add in white rice. Um, white rice has obviously the a big insulin effect, and um, insulin is very helpful for building muscle, but uh, the carbs need to be earned. Um, you can't just have them because you feel like it. They need to be a tool, and um, you know, driving the protein into the muscles is a very powerful thing when you're trying to gain more muscle mass and uh, hypertrophy. So there's a diet out there called the vertical diet that I also subscribe mm -hmm. to. Um, Stan Efferding, very genius man. Um, what is that? I keep seeing that and, I'm, and I keep meaning to look it up. The vertical diet? Yeah, what is that? So his philosophy is red meat for protein and white rice for the carbs. Um, we know that we cannot mix fat with carbs in the same meal because that leads to metabolic um, distress. The body doesn't know which one to use at once. So you can either do carbs, you can do fat, but you can have protein with either one. Um, and then with the vegetables that he chooses to include, they're very, um, they're very low on the spectrum of the FOD map, FOG map um, idea where the bacteria don't ferment these foods nearly as much. So he's got like spinach on there. He's got obviously butter, eggs. Um, he's got very low fermentable foods on there. He takes out oats. He takes out coffee. He takes out so many things that cause distress and bloating. He always, he always says that bloating is, is very um, problematic for people who are trying to gain weight, especially muscle mass. You can't possibly work out if you're bloated. So um, he, he likes to focus on foods and that are very... Um, low on the fermentation scale yeah. that makes sense yeah that's very interesting yeah I, can't, I kept seeing that word thrown around vertical diet vertical diet mm -hmm. but um i'm assuming that would be more for people in your situation who are trying to build muscle or mm -hmm. is yeah okay yeah so probably not for me <laughs> <laughs> but I already know what white rice does to me. Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay. The other thing I kind of wanted to hit on and I'm, I'm just so not there with the whole uncom being uncomfortable thing, like this cold therapy or exposure to cold, cold showers, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, no, that makes me pretty dang mad. It's not a matter of being uncomfortable. It like, makes me mad, you know? It's like when somebody uses your hot water in the shower, your hair is all soaked up, and then it turns cold. I'm screaming, hollering, grabbing, and run, getting out of that shower. So I don't understand what this big thing is, but I see it, you know, some of the big people are doing it, and they swear by it. What is the big deal about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, it goes back to this idea of discomfort leads to personal growth. Um, basically cold exposure turns on longevity genes that allow us to live longer. Um, same is very similar idea as fasting. So if you do fasting for longevity and health, then you would also consider cold exposure for health as well. So cold exposure does a million different things beneficially. The one that I'll focus on because people are most interested in weight loss is the beijing of white fat. What that means is you're making a metabolically active white fat and you're turning it into brown fat. Brown fat is very metabolically active. I think it's about 50 times more metabolically active than muscle. So if you have more brown fat, you don't have to do anything. You just have to sit around and your body will burn it your body will just burn the calories. Now this comes in handy during the cold winter months when everyone's freezing their asses off because they stay in their hot showers and they stay in their, their warmly, uh, client, you know, their warm climate houses and they never expose themselves to these temperatures. Um, but what's very interesting is obviously when you expose yourself to these environmental stressors, we get stronger every single time or we die but you're not going to die from a cold shower. So, um, somebody might, but <laughs> I think you'll be very mad, <laughs> but you're definitely not going to die. Um, no, I'm talking hurting somebody else for taking yeah. my hot water. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a lot of practice. I mean, no, um, I wouldn't be a proponent of just saying, just turn it all the way down first time. I'd say work up to it. And, uh, a lot of, 
women like to take scalding hot lava showers and uh, that's also horrible for the skin as well horrible for the hair the uh again back to the fluoride you know the skin is an organ you know we get vitamin d from the sun our skin can absorb chemicals we're breathing in fluoride and chlorine the entire shower so that hot steam is also going into our lungs messing with our skin then we have those dry skin like oh what do do we do and we put more fragrances on we put more lotion all things that are going to dry it out even more our skin microbiome is going to be shot. We are supposed to have this bacteria called, uh, it's nitrosomus something. And uh, basically it takes urea from, I think, no, uric acid. It takes uric acid and converts it into nitric oxide. So my theory is that evolutionarily when we would sweat, we would release more uric acid. I think it's uric acid. It's, it's something with a U. We release that chemical and the, the microbiome changes it into nitrous oxide where it then goes back into our skin and allows us to vasodilate, allows our, our body to kind of open up. That's what nitrous oxide is used for. Um, there's a company out there called, uh, it's escaping me at the moment, um, but the product is called Mother Dirt. And uh, essentially you spray this on your skin. And so it's a clear odorless mist of the bacteria and you spray it under your arms and around your body and uh, the odor, the body odor will disappear overnight. Um, So it's a very powerful tool. And uh, again, we lose this bacteria when we're constantly hitting it with soap and other emulsifiers that really destroy the oils that come out of the skin and, you know, mess with our genes, mess with our DNA, stuff like that. Mm. Our environment is a mess. <laughs> it's like everything from bottled water to uh, Florida in our toothpaste to using deodorant, makeup. Okay, I'm sorry, but I draw the line at makeup. I try to do the best. My skincare is really good, tallow based, all that, but my makeup, mm, no, <laughs> they just don't have the natural stuff yet. So, um, but I, I know somebody who's actually working on a natural mascara. That's like really cool. I don't know how that's going to turn out, but I was actually contacted and asked, would that be something I would consider? And I was like, heck yeah. If you can make the mascara good, yeah, I would do it in a minute. So, oh yeah, but all the chemicals is just terrible. Okay, you had mentioned at one time when we were talking about uh, humans being considered obligate, obligate carnivores. Explain about that. I think a lot of people don't really understand that. Yeah, so um, an obligate carnivore is um, an animal that requires animal products in one way or another. Um, other obligate carnivores require about 70% animal products, like, like a lion or a cat or a tiger. Um, and basically, they cannot convert the plant matter into usable forms of vitamins, like vitamin A of vitamin E, stuff like that. And um, humans are very similar. So we've evolved. We're not chimpanzees anymore. I know a lot of vegans love to say, oh, we're just like them. But I don't think people are walking around with that much hair or have arms that long or, you know, have anger problems or can climb trees like that. We're not monkeys anymore. Um, Our intestines have evolved along with our mind. And, uh, you know, humans have evolved from the chimpanzees. We've evolved to use weapons and tools. We walk on two feet. We're able to hold tools. We can find stone artifacts and see that we were, in fact, eating meat. We could even see chimpanzees eating meat. Um, and essentially, we don't have the ability to ferment that fiber anymore into usable forms of energy. So there's an uh, organ in the body called the cecum. And herbivores have a huge cecum. It's like a little giant balloon. And it's filled with bacteria. And we have a, a tiny, tiny little cecum. Um, if you look at an orangutan, it's huge. If you look at other chimpanzees, it's bigger. Ours is small. So basically, it shows us that we are not able to digest this plant matter in an efficient way anymore. So our bodies are very good at breaking down amino acids and fats. Our stomach acid is almost up there with a vulture. 
So we actually used to be scavengers and eat things that were, you know, decaying and we would be perfectly fine. Our stomach acid is super acidic. So for the vegans out there who like to say the meat rots in your gut, that's complete BS. It, it absolutely does not. If anything rots in your gut, it's all the fermented fiber that you're eating, all the gas, the bloating. If you get gas and bloating from meat, then there's a bigger issue there. I think you have some SIBO issues or um, you've been eating too many carbohydrates. Your stomach acid is no longer acidic. It's, it's not doing its job anymore. Bacteria is starting to seep through or you're taking Nexium or something like that. You know, things that are really messing with your physiology. Um, meat is 100% digested. We all use all of those amino acids and whatever we don't use, we just pee out the nitrogen and we store the uh, sugar that we could eventually create from gluconeogenesis if we eat too much. But uh, we're never going to ferment that fiber or we're never going to ferment that meat in our colons. Yeah, I took Nexium every day for eight years. Damn. Now I take nothing. No, I take nothing. But my issue was I was eating carbs, thinking I was doing good. I was eating the oatmeal. I was having my banana. I was doing all that good stuff. I was having my peanut butter because, you know, that's good protein. And on my uh, low-calorie, low-fat, whole wheat bread and honey. <laughs> yeah, and I thought I was doing really good. Well, I had indigestion so bad I wanted to die. And so... Uh, I got put on Nexium, Nexium and my doctor actually told me this. He said, you will probably be on this the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, after reading all this horrible stuff about Nexium now, how scary, how scary if I would not have, you know, taken the path I did, mm. I'd still be on it. Oh, that's so scary. What are they yeah. saying that the, the other side effects are? I know it, messes with the gut and it makes the stomach line, stomach acid not work properly. But what else are they saying? <laughs> I, I don't remember everything in there that they talked about, but it is some pretty nasty stuff. There's so many side effects to it. I mean, so many. And, I, you know, I, I believe it's even linked to cancer. And it, of course, everything nowadays is linked to cancer, right? But, you know, it's some terrible, terrible stuff and lawsuits and I mean, all this crazy stuff. Mm, yeah, no, thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we did the, let me just go through here really quick. Oh, okay. We talked about fasting, but what I wanted to ask you for, for somebody who is kind of a little bit apprehensive about fasting or they don't know how to go about it, what are some tips that you can give them to help them out if they want to try this? Yeah, so the number one reason that people would probably want to give it a shot is they want to lose weight. Um, the best way to start getting in the mindset of fasting is to, again, start eating more animal products, eating more higher fat, higher protein foods. Um, when you shift your body into ketosis or fat burning, it'll be much easier to fast as long as you want. And um, the other issue is people are afraid of salt these days. And um, it's not the pink salt that's causing the issues. It's the sodium chloride that they make in a lab. Um, that stuff is toxic. It, I've heard that it can scratch the arteries. I don't know if that's true or not. And that can lead to the hypertension that people are seeing. Additionally, there are no electrolytes to balance that out. It's just simply sodium chloride. There's no potassium there. Um, as with pink salt, there are other trace minerals to, to um, you know, keep a well-rounded profile of electrolytes and, tra and trace amino or trace um, trace minerals. I think there's even some iodine in pink salt. So essentially, for someone who has never fasted. I would say to practice a ketogenic lifestyle for the first week before their fast. Um, I would say to give them MCT oil to try it out. Um, half a dose at first, stay home. <laughs> it could definitely, if you don't have enough bile, um, lead you into, you know, distress. And once you get into a keto adaptation, you will be able to fast much longer. We don't need five meals a day. We don't need four meals a day. We don't need, three we need one to two max we're not doing that much you're not you're not michael phelps you don't need that much, that many calories 
Um, you just need to make sure your meals are accurate. They get you the nutrients that you need. And uh, you just got to learn to get out of this culture of just constant eating when you're bored. Uh, our digestive system just can't handle it. It's, you know, just think about running your car 24 seven. It, it would eventually break down all that mileage. I mean, just think about it in your intestines. Like those are tubes, the, all that stuff is running through there constantly abrading the, the lining and going through. And it's, it's just not a pretty sight. There's so much gunk stuck in there, especially if you haven't fasted ever. You eat every single day, multiple times a day for years and years and years. There's a lot of stuff in there that has to get be you know gotten rid of. So um, bone broth, pink salt, uh, maybe a little apple cider vinegar. Throw that in there um, for the days that you're fasting. And then when you get better at it, you might not even need the bone broth. Just drink your snake juice. Do your research on what that is. Just sodium. It's uh, potassium chloride, no salt, and pink salt. And uh, throw a little magnesium in there if you can. Um, but that's pretty much it. I mean, you should definitely be fasting once a week at minimum if you care about your health. Yeah, um, I, I'm a proponent of fasting. I, I don't necessarily think it's good for everyone. There's certain people who just really probably should not be doing that. But that was a big game changer for me when I was uh, doing keto about, I don't know, like six months in or whatever. I, I just was never hungry. So I, I stopped really eating one meal a day. And I, that's just what I wanted. I didn't even know about the whole fasting thing, you know, and I just started dropping weight. We went on a two week vacation and I lost 11 pounds and it was like, and I had already been steadily losing weight. So it wasn't like I just started and bam, dropped all this water weight and I was on vacation, but I didn't care. I wasn't eating. I, I just was not hungry. So I'm a big proponent of fasting personally, but I do think there are some situations where it's probably not the best, like women, you know, losing their periods and stuff like that. I mean, there's always kind of issues like that. But anyway, um, one more question before we go. I want to know like you are really big into the health. You take care of yourself, obviously. You work on your body. You have good nutrition. How do you deal with people? You know, like when you see them like doing things that damage their body and you know, and you're like, oh, please, like your family, your friends, how do you handle that? I mean, do you say something? Do you just try to be the example? Like, what do you do? Because I know like me watching these kind of things, I'm just like, oh yeah, you know, no, don't do that. You know, <laughs> how do you handle it? Um, well, a lot of my friends actually started taking my lead and following what I do. Um, a lot of my smarter friends started, you know, like reading what I would send them and, and really analyzing what they were eating. Um, as for my family, my father started fasting himself and uh, he's improved his health a little bit. And he started, you know, cutting out most of the candy and the potato chips and stuff like that. My sister um, goes back and forth. She knows she can drop weight from keto. She's done it before. But uh, whenever she's on like a, like a binge, I always make comments because it's my sister. I was just, I'm, I'm just like, you know what you're doing, right? You know, you're, you're doing your intestines. You don't feel bad. Um, as for my mother, she's got, um, you know, uh, thyroid issues. So um, I really care the most about that. And um, it's really tough just watching her, you know, not really care as much about it i mean she's good for the most part she doesn't really eat that much she just eats the chicken salads and uh, there's really no nutrients in that it's just white meat and uh salad so i tell her all the time to add some fat she's like oh, i don't want fat and then she'll go and add some salad dressing and that's filled with vegetable oil soybean oil it's gonna it's gonna exacerbate her symptoms even more so um, I always try to drill things into people, but if they simply just don't want to learn or they don't want to try it, then I bite my tongue as best I can. But when it comes to a family member, it's extremely tough. You just want them to be as healthy as you are. You want to grow old with them. You care about their health more than you care about yours. But uh, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make them drink. That's absolutely right. Okay. Well, 
one last thing. If you had some advice to give somebody or a pep talk, like say somebody is just starting their health journey, what, what kind of advice or, or, you know, nah, you know, to pump them up? Um, well, I would say that uh, they need to find their passion. They, uh, they should find their why before doing anything. Write it down, post it everywhere, put it on your lock screen, put it on your fridge. Just know your why. Um, you know, maybe if it's an older person, they want to live to see their grandchildren. Or if it's, uh, you know, a depressed teenager, they want to um, stick around longer and see, you know, you know, maybe date some women that they might find attractive um, and they can start going to the gym. But it's really finding your why and, and getting motivated that way. And motivation always goes away. It, it's, it's, it's like this, this go attitude, and then it, it just dissipates. Like, oh, I don't, I don't feel motivated today. So it's very important to build routines, things that you can do every single day. When you have that motivation, um, write it down. Write down two or three things that you're going to do every day, no matter what. Even if your arms get blown off, write it with your damn teeth. Like, that is what um, I learned from Elliot Hulse. I will not take his quote and, and not uh, cite my source. Um, but I love the way he put it. You just really have to stick to your routine. And um, the more you make things a habit, the easier they are to complete. So if you're starting a health journey, find your why, write it down, and uh, start simple, start easy. Don't start carnivore right away with all these people eating things in front of you. You're never going to flourish. Um, do the best you can. Reach out to me or Lone Star Keto, and uh, we'll help you out. Absolutely. Okay, so where can people find you? I'll put all your stuff below, but uh, just kind of give people an idea if they if they want to come to you, if they want to be one of your clients. Yeah, so I'm available at uh, human.growth.factor on Instagram. And Human Growth Factor is fine. Just type that in. Um, my name is Rob Amoroso. You can also find me on my personal account. Um, those two are the easiest way. If you want to email me, it's humangrowthfactor at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, I will definitely reach out and reply to you. Um, I enjoy helping people no matter what the situation is. Um, I just, I'm happy when other people finally reach their goals and they put a smile on their face. I'm with you. I love that. Okay, y'all. Hey, subscribe and go follow Rob. And Rob, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. Yeah, thank fun. you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Bye, Rob. All right. Bye.